Hey everybody, it's Sarah Cray with Let's Make Art and I teach watercolor and today we are painting a moose. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. We have Keenan working the cameras and we will be doing this uh, project in six steps. So our very first step is we are going to do a light wash across our moose. Our second step is we're going to start putting in the, the darker values or the shadows to start creating the form. Our third step is we'll be doing the face, so like the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and going back in and putting in some fur texture. Our fourth step, we will be doing our antlers. Our fifth step, we will be doing the rain. And our very last step are finishing details. For the supplies, we have two paint brushes. We have a round six and a round two. These are our Let's Make Art Classic series. You can also use Princeton Heritage or really whatever paint brushes you have. However, if you plan on painting with us for a long time, I suggest getting these two brushes because we use them in like more than 90% of our projects. I'd be willing to say 97.4%. Yeah, yeah. Probably. 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 Like 200 plus tutorials. <sighs> There's so many tutorials. So many tutorials. <laughs> I've done so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the colors that we are using, we have red. Actually, let me move this up. Sorry, Chris. We have red, deep yellow, emerald green, and berry blue. Okay. Oh. I decided I don't have to swatch the colors every time. I can just reuse the same sheet of paper and That's, save paper. That's genius. I'm, I'm trying. Okay, we're using the Let's Make Art watercolor paper. It is a wood pulp paper, and we are using our Dandelion Paint Go in-house paint colors. These are liquid, which means they are vibrant, but it also means they're fugitive. So if you put these in direct sunlight, they will fade over time. Um, we, when you tape your paper down, make sure that you're painting on the rougher side of the paper. I know that probably we think that we want to paint on smoother sides, but when it comes to watercolor paper, the rougher side is the way to go. And I'm using Holbein soft tape around the edges of my um, paper. It's my favorite tape. I think it's pretty cool. Um, okay, we're gonna do our outline and then our oath and then get to painting. So I taped my outline to my paper and I'm going to take my graphite paper, do dark shiny side down and whatever line I make, it will show up on my paper. Sarah. Yeah. You use the word fugitive. Yeah. To describe the paint. Yeah. What does that mean? That means it's not light fast. It means it will fade. Wow. I immediately went to the movie called Fugitive. <laughs> and even like, so liquid watercolors are dye based. They're not pigment based, which is how you can get that vibrancy in that color. Even some pigment based paints are fugitive. And actually, if you were our, um, if you got our Seeking Solace, uh, Solace box for October, we put some, we did a collaboration with Daniel Smith where um, I put in little sample dots of some of my favorite colors that I use from them. And um, the companies will list whether something is light fast or not. So you can look, there's like a chart a, a code underneath every color on like that little dot sheet that will tell you about that paint. So um, like all dye based paints are fugitive, okay? But even some pigment based ones are as well. So you just have to pay attention to that. Now for me, if I'm being just like straightforward with you, the light fat fastness of a paint never really bothered me because mostly I used to do illustrative work, which meant that I would scan and digitize all of my paintings and then put them in books or for cards or greeting cards or cell prints or something like that. I never really worked with original art and so it didn't really matter if the color lasted forever. Um, now that I'm starting to sell um, original artwork, then I am starting to pay attention to um, the light, fastness, and um, how long paintings will last and all of that stuff. So it's just been interesting. But I would say for sure that like, just because a painting, a paint is not light fast, does not mean that you shouldn't use it. It really just depends on what you're using it for. So when I'm painting for fun, when I'm learning, when I'm playing, I love using liquid watercolors because of their vibrancy. 
that makes me want to paint more. And if I know that I'm going to be digitizing the work or making cards or something, then it doesn't really matter to me if it fades over time. But if I'm focusing on original artwork, if I'm painting something that I want to last for a long time, that's when you're going to want to pay attention to it. So my whole philosophy when it comes to using art supplies is I really don't like saying, oh, this is inherently bad or this is inherently good. I think it just depends on your purposes and then utilizing the tools for those purposes. That's it. Nice. Okay. So you'll notice on this outline, we have some like lines and hash marks. You don't have to trace those in. I put those there to remind you of like highlights or darker values. Um, so it's totally up to you if you want to put them in or not. And these are kind of little like detail hairs, so I'm going to put those in. Okay. I think, I think that's everything. I thought the fun thing with this project too, cause I know we're in November right now and I know we're also probably getting close to like holidays, right? Right. And people want to paint some like holiday projects. I thought it'd be so cute. I did this posture of this moose because I thought it would be cute. You can put ornaments on off the antlers or you can move it up a little bit and have like a Christmas scarf around the moose's neck. That's a great idea. Isn't that cute? Also, what about, hear me out? Yeah. A Santa hat on his head. <gasps> yes. You guys can totally holiday, holiday eyes, Christmas. Cri you can take these projects and turn them Christmas <laughs> season. <I'm sorry. laughs> All right, let's do our oath. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I promise to be kind to myself. Promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. Promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. And I love starting that way because it's just a friendly reminder. We are not interested in being the best here. We're not interested in beating other people with our artwork skills. We're not interested in making people feel like they don't belong. We are interested in creating a place that makes it easy and fun and art accessible. That, that's it. Yeah. So like, there's no competition. This isn't the end of the world. It's a piece of paper. If it turns out bad, that doesn't mean you're not supposed to be an artist. That means a painting turned out bad. Throw it away. Start a new one. Yeah. Keep going. It's easy. This is the process for everybody. And if somebody tells you different, they're lying. Okay. Send them to <laughs> us. Send them to us. It's not true. <laughs> it's really hard. It just takes time and practice. That's all. Okay. So I'm going to start with step one. I'm going to do my underpainting. So I'm going to get like a warm, light brown. So um, the bonus item in this box is a color wheel. You guys can see this handy dandy thing here. Super helpful. Um, but basically to make brown or neutrals, you're going to want to mix things that are opposite from the color wheel of each other. So let's start with red and green. I'm going to take some red. I'm going to take some green. Oh, look, brown. Okay, <laughs> but that's easier said than done. It is. It really is. And also the types, depending on how much the ratio of the colors that you mix together will inform the brown. So let's, I'll just show a different one. Let's do blue and let's see what happens when we add yellow. So blue and yellow are not across from each other on the color wheel, right? So that's why you're getting more like a desaturated green. But what is across from blue is orange. So I could take some of this yellow, I can take some of this red, and then mix that into there. And now I have a grayer brown. Mm. You see? Yes. And I actually am going to mix these browns together to get my brown. Oh. oh. Isn't that a good... That's a great brown. That's a great brown. A good brown is just like there. You know what I mean? I love like a, a good brown. Like a warm cup of hot cocoa. Yeah. Or a nice cold bowl of ice cream. <laughs> Brown? Brown. Chocolate ice cream. I mean, there's more flavors than just chocolate. There are not. There, <laughs> <laughs> there can only be one. There can only be the Highlander. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take my round six. I have my colors mixed. 
Also, I just want to like pat myself on the back, which is I'm starting to pre-mix my colors before we paint. I didn't do that before, but I hope it's helpful now. But good job, me, for remembering to do that. Wow. Okay, so I have my <laughs> paintbrush wet. I'm going to hit it off the side of the cup so it's not dripping. I'm going to grab some of this brown that I laid down, I mean that I pre-mixed, and I'm just going to start painting in my mousse. So what I like to do is I like to put in my color and then grab water and just pull from that color. And by doing this, one, you make your painting, your paints last way longer. And two, you're already bringing in different values to your painting because like where you put down your color initially, there's a value. And then when you use water to spread it out, that's a lighter value. So you, we already are getting some value differences and saving paint and doing all this really wonderful stuff. Now, when I get to the top of the nose here, I wanna go really, really light in my value, barely their color. And that's because that area is gonna be the lightest value on my mousse. When I get to the top of the head. And so like, even this first initial step of putting color down, I try and pay attention to where the dark values are and where they are not because that will help inform me of where I should lay down my color first. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So like, because I know that this top of the nose slash head is a lighter value, I'm not gonna put down my first strokes of color. But like the mouth area and the nose area is actually a darker value, so I feel pretty good putting that color down there and then just spreading it out. And that's because if it doesn't blend all the way out and it stays a darker value, that's fine. It's a darker value area anyway. Nice. And now we're gonna, um, actually I'm gonna do one more. So like what I was saying, like, you know, putting that shadow down or that darker value down and then blending it out. You can do that, I'm gonna do that here, like underneath the neck that connects to the body and underneath the chin. Good looking reindeer. Okay, can I tell you guys? <laughs> I was telling this to Keenan a little bit when I was making these projects, but I have a really hard time with moose. I love, I, I have nothing against moose the animal, but when I go to paint, when I went to paint a moose, I have an idea of what this animal looks like in my head. And then when I'm actually painting it, I'm like, this can't be right. Like the thickness of the neck and just like this jawline and like the ears and stuff, like it threw me for a loop where I kept on looking at my reference photos and like what I was painting. And I was just like, is this right? You know, like I just felt like I wasn't getting it right. And um, I don't, maybe that's just a personal problem. Maybe you guys won't experience that, but like, seriously, it threw me off. And you I was just like- struggled with the moose. I struggled with the moose because I was just like, is this, like the amount of pictures that I sent to my husband, Michael, as I was painting it and being like, you could tell this is a moose, right? <laughs> and he was just like, what are you talking about? Yes, and I'm like, my brain is not accepting that this is a moose, I don't know why. And it w this, and I'm telling you, it's the antlers. The antlers is what give it away, okay? If you hide the antlers off of this, you're gonna be like, what? I mean, right now I can see a long-eared goat. Yeah. You know, I could see that being difficult. Cause I'm like, are you, are you a horse? Like yeah, what? what is happening? Yeah. I don't know, it was just, it was kind of a funny, funny surprise that I wasn't really expecting because. So did it take longer for you to finish it then? I don't know if it took, I think I probably messed with it way more than I probably usually would have because I kept on being like, wait, is this, wait is this right? <laughs> like, um, so yeah, it took me a little bit longer and I had to have a little bit more extra external support to make sure mm. that it, like all the pictures with Michael of making sure it, it looks like a moose. it was in fact a moose. Yeah. So you're talking documentaries. Yeah. And meeting a moose <laughs> for the first time. That's I had to go, I had to go touch the moose. <laughs> I had to be like, is this really the shape of your nose? 
had to feel it. <laughs> I'm laughing, but actually that's super helpful to do sometimes. To touch faces and to paint them? Yeah. Okay. Like if you're doing a dog portrait. Oh yeah. Like if you can touch the dog to understand like the skull and the feel of the fur and like that kind of, it's actually really helpful. Okay, we're moving on to step two. We're gonna start putting in the shadows on our moose. So I just wanna call them out. We have a shadow on the nose here, on the side of the head, so like the cheek, underneath the jawline, and then back here as this neck is meeting the body. Now, when it comes to darker values, when you're painting anything, they're super important because that's actually what gives our shape form. Shape is two-dimensional, a shape is a circle. Form is three-dimensional, a sphere is a form. And the only difference between those two is the values within that shape. So if you're looking at um, like, uh, like a triangle and a pyramid and you know what I mean, like a cube and a square, it's, it's more about the values within that and that is what gives it that three dimensionality. So it's super important to make sure you understand values and um, to make your painting pop. So I pretty much used all of my brown. Let's mix some more. And I'm not the type of person where like, I don't stress out if my brown, if I have to keep mixing new browns as I go and they don't exactly match what I've already laid down here. That doesn't bother me because I feel like it just adds to color richness. Oh yeah. Okay, so now that I have my darker values, I'm gonna go along here. And then just you rinse your brush and blend out. Okay. And then underneath this jawline here. Are more than one moose still called a moose Don't or they know. look it up what is the plural of meese moose? that's it moosin <laughs> moosai moosai okay underneath the antler we have some we're going to go along kind of the side of the face here and hopefully at this point your mousse starts to kind of pop. And that's some of my, one of my favorite parts in a painting is when you're painting something and it starts to come off the page and you're like, yes, you are a real boy, you know? <laughs> I'm a real boy. <laughs> now you gotta be careful here too because what's tricky about the head and the neck is both are shadowed but the neck underneath the neck should be a darker value than the like chin because we're trying to communicate two different things we're trying to communicate form and then we're also trying to communicate that these are on different planes the jaw and the nose is sticking out further than the neck the neck is actually the furthest thing away so we're trying to communicate yes this is three-dimensional yes both of these um, kind of need to we need spatial awareness, but one is actually further away than the other. And so you just got to make sure that you got a darker value on that part to help that pop. Separate it. So the plural of moose is in fact moose. It is. Yes. Great. Wow. Fun facts. And then the top of the head, it actually is a little bit darker value too. It's going away from us. Also, moose are huge. They're huge. 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 On average, male Alaskan moose are nearly seven feet tall at the shoulder. No! And weigh more than 1,400 pounds. Okay, are they peaceful animals? I mean, could you imagine coming across an animal that big and it being aggressive? I mean, I know nothing of moose. I'm not trying to be... I have no idea. I have no idea. People, let us know. 
I'm going to ask Google. Okay. Are moose, 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 aggressive? Maybe ask if they're like, I don't even know what they, gosh, I know so little about moose. Moose are not normally aggressive. Okay. However, they can become aggressive when they are harassed by people, dogs, and traffic. Well, I get that. I mean, Me I too. become aggressive. Well, here's the kicker. Oh. Or when hungry and Well, tired. that's true, actually. <laughs> I identify with moose more than I thought. My spirit animal is a moose. This is so funny, especially in winter when they must walk through deep snow. Oh my gosh. They're like, this sucks. Don't make me angry. And I'm hungry. Get out of my way. I'm bigger than you and your car. <laughs> Don't mess with me. They are huge. Amazing. So you can see here, like especially around like the nostril and the mouth, I'm leaving a little bit of a white edge. And that's just to remind myself that those are like different areas going on within this painting. And when I go in and do my shadows, like it's clear where I need to put them. Don't forget this little back guy over here. So I'm just kind of finessing, I would say, these different values on my mousse. Making sure they kind of blend together, making sure they're staying dark where I want them to stay dark. Also, when it comes to animals, like, they always look creepy and scary until you put the eyes in. Always, always, always. So don't let that stop you. Unless you like that. Yeah, I mean. Okay. I'm gonna leave that alone for a second. And um, we are going to move to um, step three. We're going to do the face and um, the fur and the ears. I'm going to look at the ears first. I got to mix some more brown. So I got red and I got green. Mix in here. And then I'm also going to do red and yellow and blue. Okay. And then I want to make an almost like black color. So I'm going to grab some blue. I'm just going to mix all the colors together. Blue, green, yellow, red, and more blue. We want this to feel, be a little bit on the cooler because we want this to read as black, not brown. There we go. So I mixed all the colors together with more blue than the rest of it. And now I have like a really dark gray. Okay. So Rinsing my brush that I used to mix. I'm gonna grab some brown. I'm gonna do the inside of the ear. Use water to spread that out. And then on the edge of the ear, kind of like the outside, it's darker. So I'm gonna use my two, grab that dark value that I mixed. And put that in. Now if it bleeds a little bit, I don't care. I never really mind when I get a little bit of bleeding with the ears. I don't know why. I think it's just kind of cool. Okay. And then this other ear, it's really just the hint of it because the antler is covering it. So it's just a little hint. <laughs> and it was at this point in my painting that I'm like, this is not a moose. That's not what a full is ear. it? That's not a real moose. <laughs> 
What am I painting? What am I doing? Uh. Don't worry, we'll put in the antlers, we'll put in the eyes, and everything will be okay. We just gotta make it to that moment, you guys. It'll be okay. <laughs> Does it help to be able to see it through the top camera? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, it does. It's comforting. Yeah, so if you're just getting so frustrated, step away for a second. Or like take a picture of it and look at it through your Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Camera. Okay. Gosh, it just cracks me up. Ugh. Okay, now I'm going to do the eye. So, I, if you can see in the outline, I left a little like section within the eye that I want to stay like white. Um, so I'm gonna paint around that. So I'm gonna grab this dark value that I mixed. Or if you have black, you can use black. You can even use like a black pen, you know, like mm. it's a tiny area. So I'm just going to, using my two, Now this little white section is gonna serve as a glare. And I'm gonna soften this after that black dries for a second. But you wanna be careful because sometimes with glares, if you leave them too big or too white, they become like something else. They no longer look like a glare. It looks like a pupil or, you know, sometimes it just looks like the eyes are really white or something like that. So just be aware. And then I'm gonna just kind of paint around the eye like the eyelid section, being careful not to touch the black of what I just put down. And if you want to let that dry for a second before you go to that area, you absolutely can. Okay. And now I'm going to use that same dark value and put in that little line on my nostril. Okay. Mm. And then the mouth. And mouths are always a little bit funny because um, they can kind of give you an idea of like the expression of like, I'm smiling, you know, <laughs> or I'm not, that kind of thing. I'm so, swarthy. Yeah. So just so you guys know, like, I never really know the expressions or what these animals are going to look like until I put in, like, the eyes and the mouth because <laughs> that gives so much expression information. Could be terrified. Yeah. That'd be a great expression to have on a moose. I don't know why. <laughs> 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 Okay, and while this is drying, I'm gonna do some rough um, tech, uh, dry brush technique on my mousse um, for some fur. I'm not doing that right now. I'm playing with my valleys right now. So give me, give me just a second. You guys might not need this, but I'm just looking at this and I feel like I need a little bit of extra definition. And then I'm gonna blend this highlight just a little bit. The tricky thing with like highlights and lowlights is we leave an area to be highlighted and then as we add more and more values, um, suddenly the highlight can be too light. Mm -hmm. So that's when you need to go in and kind of adjust it. So um, I'm gonna leave, for me, I feel like I needed to soften mine a little bit. Yours might not need that. So just look at your painting, look at what it needs and you have the right to make those decisions for your painting. The worst thing that's gonna happen is you'll throw it away and start again. And that doesn't seem so scary, you know? No, that's not bad. Okay, so I'm gonna make some more brown. And then, instead of picking up water with my brush, I want this to be dry, so I've like mixed my brown and then I'm going to, you can either use your paper towel and dry your brush on your towel or even like on your palette. 
So then when you take it to your painting, you're going to get a rough texture. Oh, that's cool. And we did this on mm -hmm. elephant friends. Yes. We did this on a branch for our parrot, which turned out awesome. So this is just me showing, you can just do some like little textural things that this is supposed to communicate like fur. Um, and you don't have to like think too hard about it. You can just let the brush do the work. Let the brush do the work, which I personally am a huge fan of. Ooh, you could even give your moose like some age, some wisdom, mm -hmm. and put some white fur directly underneath, maybe. Mm, That'd yeah. That'd be weird. That would be cool. Yeah, it would. Okay. And then I kind of left the area right around the eye white, and I'm just going to go in and soften that. Soften that by pulling a little bit of color. I didn't pick up any color. I'm just pulling color from around it. Hmm. Okay. And soften this too. Look at him coming to life. Look at him popping out. Okay, let's do the antlers. Let's, so this will actually look like a mix. Okay, so in the, um, when I painted this project, one thing that I did is I, for these little areas that poke out from the antlers. I don't know the specific name. Hmm. Um, I turned my painting upside down and let it drip. And that's why I have some of these like drip textures. Um, or you can just paint them in. I'm just gonna paint them in right now because my painting is taped to essentially my table. Um, but if you're using like a paint pad or a paint board, you can tip your painting up and let these kind of like paints run and see what textures you get. So on this left hand one, we actually see the back side, like this is the front side of the antler. And then we see like the back side and I want it to be clear that those are two different areas. So I'm gonna use two different values. So mixing water into my browns to get a really light value, I'm gonna paint my back, the back side of these antlers. I wanted to confirm before I told you the name, but they're called points. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that's easy. Mm -hmm. We're going to just paint the point. You can use the drip technique to do the points or not, or you can just paint them in, whatever you want. I think I ended up doing both. I did some on the drip that I think worked out really well, and then other ones, it just wasn't like moving, so I ended up painting them anyway. Okay. So let, let's mix some more brown. There we go. So I'm using this and then it's going to be darkest underneath. So that's where I'm putting my color down first. And then I'm doing a dip into the water and moving that color that I already laid down up into the points. But remember, we want the value to be the darkest at the bottom and then get lighter as it goes up. Already, I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. You're a moose. I see you now. This moose should be named Silas. Why? I don't know. It just seems right. Okay. I don't know if I've ever met a Silas in person. Really? Yeah, I like that name. It's a good name. Don't you have a brother named Silas? I do. <laughs> and I'm going to tell him to watch this tutorial. Does this moose remind <laughs> you of your brother? No, I just wanted to name the moose after him. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, my initial thought was, I need some, some names for this male noose, moose, excuse me. And 
was like, oh, I usually use like a Frederick mm-hmm. sounding name or a Frank. I was like, what about S names for, for a male moose? And then I thought of Silas. That's good. So. Silas the moose. So I'm just kind of darkening my values on my antlers on the bottom. And then going off into my left one, I already got my brown. Making sure that it's dry before I paint it. This section is dry, the under part that we already put down, making sure that's dry. And I feel like when it comes to like the points on antlers, some of them that I've seen are roundish and some of them are like sharp. Yeah, I think they vary depending on how old they are. Okay. So I've seen, in the short amount of time I've researching it, I think there's also a difference in what type of elk, moose or, or even elk look similar. Oh, really? Yeah, because some of them have, like, furry points. Like, furry points? Yeah, like, they're, they're, they look more fuzzy. Oh. Okay. Wait, so is this a moose or an elk? Am I painting? Did I? No, I'm pretty sure you're painting a moose. Okay. <laughs> Let me look at the differences. Okay. That sounds good. And then, um, okay, so I put in my antlers. I feel pretty good about them. I think, I think they look good. And I'm starting to, I kind of just like breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief because I'm like, oh, it's a moose. <laughs> People can tell, hopefully. I totally can. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into, before I do my rain, this is where like, I'm gonna do, using my round two, do you remember on the outline I had those little dashes for fur around the eye yep. and the nose? I'm gonna start putting kind of those more details in here. Now I don't go too crazy with my fur um, mark making, um, cause one, we used our dry brush technique, which hopefully gave our viewer a good amount of information on the texture. Um, but also if you use like the same kind of brush stroke and shape like across an entire thing, like doing dashes across an entire thing. Cause that's what our brain likes to do. Like our brain is like, oh, it's hairy. So I just got to do long thin lines across the entire thing. Um, but those long thin lines actually like connect with other ones and creates like chunks of hair. And that is more uh, realistic to our eye and the viewer than just doing long thin lines. So um, that being said, like be aware of, be aware of uh, how many you're doing, just give enough information. So it adds, um, gives the viewer an understanding like, yes, this is small fur around here and that kind of thing. But don't go too crazy that you flatten all of the form that you created with your different values of your underpainting. Give your moose a little, some pinstripes. Yeah. Combed hair. He's looking good for the, the weekend. Yeah. Okay, this is looking, this is looking good. I think I still need to narrow in the highlight on the nose. So I'm just gonna go along the edges. An elk has more of like a deer face. Okay. And a moose has a much larger face. Okay. A bulbous nose, they say. Okay. I'm just kind of softening my 
highlight on my nose. The, the highlight on this nose kind of gives our viewer the, the understanding of the, um, the overall structure of the, of the moose, like the skull and stuff. That's why I'm just being a little bit paying attention to that. There we go. Okay, that feels good. Um, and now we are going to do our rain. So using your round two, you're gonna grab, you can grab berry blue and mix it with like a little bit of brown just to desaturate it. And I'm like, you know in pictures of rain where it's like more of a line instead of a drop? Because the rain antler, is moving. Antlers, I need you to ask that question, I'm sorry. Like in pictures of rain, it's like a line yes. instead of a dot because yes. it's moving. That's what we're gonna do here. So using this really light value blue, make sure that we de desaturate it with a little bit of brown. I'm gonna be doing little dashes. And I'm gonna be adjusting the values. So some are really light and some are not so light. Antlers are wild. This is crazy to me. How much you're learning? Well, just, I don't understand how they work still. Okay. So it says each spring, usually in April, antler bone begins to grow inside a nourishing skin covering on the moose's head. Called velvet, due to its short, soft hairs. Antlers are one of the fastest growing tissues of an animal. This person has seen an up to eight inches of antler growth in a span of nine days. Whoa! I wonder if that's painful. I feel like if it's like teething, if it's a tissue, I don't know. Okay, the other thing that I'm going to do to like add to this kind of rainy wet effect is rinsing my brush and using just water. I'm actually going to like smear some of the color that we laid down like around the antler, around the body, like, I don't know, just to give that feel of like, that it's wet, even though, you know, like rain doesn't make our skin fall off, but I just felt like it added to like that feel of um, blurriness. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So antlers are a part of the skull. They're purely bone. And they fall off every winter to make room for new growth. They fall off completely? That's what it says right here. Does it, do they come back like stronger? Bigger? Or like bigger, yeah. I think as they age, they get bigger antlers. This there's, is wild. There's so much more information than I was expecting to learn. <laughs> okay, so I'm doing dashes. I'm mixing up the values, the, sh the overall size of them, similar to our leaves actually, like think of that, the values and the form. And then our very last step is just any like finishing details. So this is where you can like add some more texture. If you feel like it needs a little bit more texture, add some more values. If you think it needs a little bit larger, I mean a little bit, um, some darker areas. Maybe do some more, I'm gonna do some more dry brush down here. There's our moose. Look at Silas. Look at Silas, our moose. <laughs> Very cool. This one, the tape 
reveal won't be as exciting because yeah. we didn't paint it to edge. So I'm just gonna leave it. But anyways, I hope you guys had fun with this mousse. <laughs> and maybe I'm crazy and I'm the only one that struggled with it. And the whole time people are like, yeah, this is a mousse. I don't I know what the problem is. Minute, so. <laughs> um, and if you're on Instagram, you can tag us at Let's Go Make Art. If you're on Facebook, you can join our watercolor community. That's called Let's Make Art Watercolor. And if you need any of these supplies or this kit, you can find it at letsmakeart.com. That's it. Thanks, Keenan. Bye, you guys.